let's go back to 2 Samuel and uh, uh, chapter 11. Then we're going to do something a little bit different today in the message. I, I like going to church and not knowing for sure sometimes what God's going to do. Boy, I tell you, I appreciated them the testimonies this morning. They fired, they fired my furnace up. Amen. And I appreciate it. Second Samuel chapter 12. I'm sorry. Second Samuel chapter 12. Oh, dear Lord, we thank you for being in church today. Thank you for another Sunday that you've given us to worship the living God. And Lord, I thank you that we can know that we're saved. Now, Lord, today, I know you don't want nobody in this church house being falsely, have, getting, having false assurance. But I know you want them to have Bible assurance. So, Lord, I pray there'd be such a spirit of truth in this church house today that folks, when they leave out of this building, they'd know they're either saved or they're not. Uh, Lord, I pray that there'd be no false assurance. Lord, I, but I pray that there'd be true Bible assurance. And, Lord, I pray where there's not good, sure Bible assurance, I pray God put the fear of the Lord and the fear of hell fire on them. And I pray, God, that uh, the Holy Ghost will fall upon them in conviction. And, Lord, that you'll bring them to yourself. And they'll see, Lord, their helplessness and their sinfulness and their wickedness in the light of the word of God, not in the light of man. And I pray, God, that old time Holy Ghost Bible conviction will fall on them. And I pray, Lord, that they'd find a place and run to the cross of Calvary and see a dying Savior who died for their sins, Lord. And I pray, God, make them see it. Lord, we're blind to the bat. We can't see till you open our eyes. But, oh, God, when you open our eyes and pull the curtain of glory back and we see the truth, Lord, it, it changes. So, Lord, I pray this be a good day today and folks will be saved. And folks will get assurance about their salvation. And Lord, they get truth would just lighten up the whole place and the whole part of our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Second Samuel chapter 12, we said last week, this is the chapter where um, God sent Nathan, the man of God, to David after his awful, awful sin. How many in here, and I'm not trying to be ornery, but besides me, has lived under the weight of sin and it, uh, it weighed you down. You didn't have no peace and there was no tranquility and there was no rest until you got it right with God. Anybody besides me been like that? I think it's pretty common. But now, here's what I want to tell you. David did an awful thing. He, you know, man, just stole another man's wife, committed adultery with her, deceived everybody around him constantly, trying to keep the, keep the sin hid, and wound up having a man killed over it. And it, it just got worse and worse. And then beyond all that, he just got quiet and silent and hid it for a year. Baby was born. He still did nothing about it. Now, I want you to turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 6. That's what Samuel, or what Nathan's coming to deal with there in 2 Samuel 12. God put this story of David in the Bible. It's an interesting thing to me that David, for a year, said nothing to nobody about it, as far as we know. Hid it and covered it. And it tore his life up. But I'm thankful God doesn't leave us there. I'm glad God sends somebody. I'm glad God comes. I'm glad the Holy Ghost of God comes. I'm glad preaching comes or a friend comes or a parent comes or a brother comes and deals with us about our sin through the Lord. But here's what I want to go to this morning. And, and this is a very important subject to me. In the book of Psalms, there are seven Psalms where David deals with the godly sorrow that he experienced after Nathan came to him. Now, it's chapter 12. Nathan comes to him and David breaks. The fountain broke up. As quick as, quick as the prophet Nathan said, thou art the man, I mean the fountain of the deep broke up. It was like I said last week, a great bull exploded out of his soul. And at that point, David starts writing these seven psalms of sorrow over his sin. And I'm going to tell you the truth. I can't in this message today get to the bottom of this. But, you know, we're living in time. Oh, by the way, can I stop just a second? I heard the beating of story. Would you mind if I just stop a second? There was a city guy. He was got lost out in the country, and he got on an old paved farm to market road, kind of like goes out to my house. And he's doing about 50, 55, and Brother Terry, a chicken ran up alongside him on the road. He looked, a chicken running beside him, 50 mile an hour. The funny thing, he noticed it was three-legged. It was a three-legged chicken. That chicken went around him, and he so he... Stepped on the gas to try to stay up with it. And he got down the road. That chicken turned in an old driveway. And he, boy, he said, I, I, I can't get over this. And he followed that chicken. That chicken lost. It, it got away from him. But he drove down to the end of the white driveway. And an old farmer come out. The overalls on everything come out there. And he said, uh, 
He said, how can I help you? He said, well, I was following a three-legged chicken. Passed me on the road, so I've never seen such a fast chicken. The old boy said, yeah. I said, we raise them. You raise them? He said, yeah. He said, well, how, why come you to raise them? He said, well, he said, my wife, she likes drumsticks. Awful bad off a chicken. And he said, we got married. And he said, I love drumstick. So he said, that's both drumsticks every time we kill a chicken. And he said, that was okay till we had our first child. And he said, we had a little boy and said, he grew, started growing up and he liked drumsticks. And he said, well, that created a problem. So he said, I started raising three-legged chickens so everybody in the house could have a drumstick. And the old boy said, well, how do they taste? He said, I don't know. We've never caught one yet. <laughs> he never caught one yet. Hey, you know what? You got to <laughs> don't sit there chicken. <laughs> we got to have a little fun once in a while. Amen. Got to have a little fun. Once a while. Can, you say, Reggie, why did you tell that joke for? Can I tell you something? There'll be a day come when you can laugh after you've sinned. I want to tell you something. David couldn't laugh for a long time. David couldn't enjoy a story. He couldn't enjoy a joke. He couldn't enjoy nothing. We're going to read about it. I just want you to know this. The issue is not that you sinned and messed up with God. The issue is what are you, how are you responding to God today? The blood's been shed. Price has been paid. But what are you going to do with it? Now, we're going to read these six uh, things. But as I said, seven, uh, seven of these things, seven is the number of completion in the Bible. Okay? Now, David's sin here with seven psalms, what does that tell you? If he wrote seven psalms concerning his repentance and his godly sorrow over his sin, what does that tell you? Complete repentance. Now, I'm going to give you something this morning. You listen to me well. Terry, how many times have you been at the jailhouse, you and these men? A lot of times. I've been there a lot of times. I'm going to tell you there's a real problem at the jailhouse. You know what it's called? Incomplete repentance. But this is not just a problem in the jailhouse. You see, a lot of boys over in the jailhouse, they're very, very sorry that the cops caught them. And they're very, very sorry of the consequences that they're getting paid for it, okay? But they're not very many of them are really sorrowful toward God about it. I'm going to tell you what's wrong with our churches in America today. Why we've, have to have, why we've had to move rock and roll and everything else into our churches to have a whop whop service is because we have incomplete repentance. Let me tell you something. When God moves in, when people truly repent and have a godly sorrow and God moves in, you don't need smoke and mirrors. You don't need rock music. You don't need drums. You know God's there. If nothing else is there, God's there. And that only comes when people have complete repentance of sin. And I'm going to tell you a story about the churches and Christians in America. All they're chasing, they're chasing churches that will not demand that they have complete repentance of sin. And as quick as they find out that that church is going to preach this Bible and that they're going to preach the truth of Christ and that Christ, he said, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Every, I'll tell you what they'll do. You'll see them advertise on their promotional deals, churches, about our praise and worship service. But you will not hear them advertise about their prayer meeting and their repenting. Amen. Let me tell you why in the book of Acts that God said David was a man after God's own heart. Because David had a complete, deep Genuine repentance of his sin toward God. A deep return of his soul. He wasn't coming to church to play games with God. And get me off the hook for a little while. And, and salve my sin. And make me feel a little bit better. And go through an emotional stir. To kind of ease up my soul. David wrote seven psalms. God showing us. That if you want to be free. And you want to be right. And you want to be right with God. And right with everybody else. Completely repent of your sin deeply. That's a fact. Now you say, Reggie, is that a Bible doctrine? Well, it's strange then, isn't it, that in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 through 11, that the Holy Ghost gives seven evidences of a true repentance. Take your, well, we're going to do something. Let's take off in Psalms chapter 6 first. Now here's my, here's the goal of this message today. I got two of them. One is, if you're out here, and you can float along for a long time, David did. You can float along a long time with sin in your life as a Christian, not deal with it. And I'm going to tell you what happens. If you don't deal with it, you don't have complete repentance. The first thing you know, you're going to get out of sorts with everybody. Because you've got to blame somebody for the church service not being as good as you thought it ought to be. Mm-hmm. I mean, the singing ain't good. The preaching, sorry. He's too mean. He's too soft. <laughs> 
Everybody's got something wrong with them. Amen. I want to tell you, when you get complete repentance, that stuff is swept out of the, the river of God's grace. will sweep that out of your soul, and it won't be not, that anymore. It'll be, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Now, let's see what David did. And let's, we're just going to do a lot of reading. Psalms chapter 6, everybody there say amen. amen. All right, here we go. Now, I want you to watch this. This is the first Psalms of David's repentance and godly sorrow, and his getting right with God after this wicked, wicked deep sin. He said, oh Lord, rebuke. Me. Now, I want you to watch how many times he says, me, I, me. He is dealing with person. First thing you're going to find out about David's repentance, he's not worried about how everybody else's walk with God is. He's worried about what his walk with God is. He's not worried about what somebody else did. He ain't saying, God, well, how come Bathsheba? Bathsheba's over on the rooftop, and she hadn't been over there. And he ain't going to say, hey, God, why this, that, and the other? Lord, you know how hard I've been working. You know how tough, rough, tough life been on me. Nothing of that kind. It was all personal responsibility. Can I tell you, when you stand before God, God Almighty, it's going to be you and not anybody else. Amen. You're going to blame your mom, your daddy, your brother, your sister, preacher, everybody else. You're going to blame Donald Trump or Obama. I don't tell you. Hey, it ain't going to work. Amen. He said, oh, Lord, rebuke me, not in thine anger. David's pleading with God. Neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. You know something David knew? That God gets angry about sin. That God is displeased. The Bible said the thing that David had done had displeased the Lord. The last thing it says in chapter 11. And David understands that God is a holy God. A holy God. A holy God. And he has nothing to do with this wickedness and this sin. And God is not adjusting himself to David's sin. David knows it is his responsibility to get right with God. He's not asking God to move. And he knows that as a child of God, God is going to chasten him. He said, oh, Lord, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Verse 2, have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I'm weak, O Lord. Heal me, my bones are vexed. David's telling the truth. You sin and don't get right with God, God will start chasing you and your health. And it'll start down your bones. You know what the problem is? That's where your blood's amazed, down your bones. I want to tell you something. God will work on you. And you know what? He, well, anyway, he, but I want you to notice what he said. Have mercy upon me. When's the last time, when's the last time you ever heard anybody cry out for mercy? When's the last time you've ever asked God to be merciful to you? I'm telling you what, folks, we don't even know what we're, we don't, this church in this day and age don't know anything about, I mean, I'm telling you something, there's no more, no more people call upon God for mercy. It's always kind of, well, I believe in Jesus, now you don't have, now you can't see me to hell stuff. David said, Lord, have mercy upon me. He said, I'm weak. Did you know the Bible says in the first Corinthians 11 that you get ready to take the, the Lord's Supper and you won't get right with God? Did you know it said many are weak and some even sleep? God will affect your health. He'll affect your body if you don't get right with God. Verse number three, my soul is sore vexed. You know what he's saying? I'm being wore down by it, wore down by it, wore down by it, wore down by it. I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm worn down. He said, my sin is heavy on me. But he said, oh Lord, how long? Said, God, how long till you're going to do something to help me? Can I tell you right now, and I don't mean this to be honorary, but I tell you right now, if we had complete repentance in this country, if the churches would get back to teaching people and preachers and help people to know how to have complete repentance, you wouldn't need all these pills and Prozac and Ritalin and all this stuff people are taking to try to stay sane. I'm telling you, David got right with God and God healed him. God touched him. He didn't need their pills. He didn't need their shrinks. He needed God. And I'm going to tell you right now this morning, you listen to this preacher. I'll, I'm dying on this. I'm telling you, I'm going in the glory on this. This book's what you need. You need Christ. You need the truth. You need to get clean down deep inside. There ain't nothing like it. Nothing like it. He said in verse number four, return, O Lord, have delivered my soul. Oh, save me for thy mercy's sake. And then he pleads that he pleads with the Lord in death. There's no remembrance of thee in the grave who shall give. He said, Lord, you can kill me. But God, what good is that going to do? I'll not have any testimony in the grave for you, Lord. God, have mercy upon me. And he said, Lord, verse number six, watch this. This I'm weary with my groaning. All the night make my, my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. That's a man who's under the weight of sin. He's needing the forgiveness of God. He's needing that, he's needing that sin washed out of his life. He's needing to get right with God. Verse number seven, mine eyes consumed because of, it, of grief. It waxeth old because of all my, all my enemies. Can I tell you something right now? This is one of the dirtiest tricks the devil's got I know of. He'll get you to sin, and then he's got you weighted down. Your, I mean, all these effects are coming up on you physically, mentally, emotionally. They're falling upon you spiritually, and you're literally in a tormented 
as it were, hell on earth because of your sin. And God's not going to let you get by. By the way, if you can get by with sin, you're not saved. If you don't get, I'll tell you every time, ever since I got saved in 1982, when I sin, chastening. me. God, he treats me exactly like he treats David. He'll give me a space to see if I'll voluntarily and willingly repent. Say, God, I got off base, got out of line. Lord, I've done thus and thus, and I want to ask your forgiveness, and God, I'm sorry. But if I don't do that, whoo, here it comes. I promise you, here it comes. My problem is sometimes is trying to determine whether I'm under chastening or under testing. And I ain't got all that figured out, but I know I'm a child of God by chastening. Now, some of it, I'd have no trouble. <laughs> I knew the chastening, amen? He'd give me a whooping. He said, my eyes can consume. I'm telling you, the light of your eye will go out when you got sin in your life. That's why mama says to the child, look me in the eye and tell me that. She watching your eye. Verse number, uh, verse number eight. But, but what I was going to say was, you'll find out that when you sin, a lot of people will become your enemies. They're glad to see you fall. They live on it. They love it. And they like to talk to other people about your sin. And they become your, David amassed a horrible group of enemies because of this. Verse number eight, depart from me, all you workers of iniquity, for the Lord hath. Now watch it. Everything you're going to find out, this is the sweet, sweet part. I said on one hand, God wants to teach us about the necessity of complete repentance. But on the other hand, he wants us to know the joy that God does forgive and God does cleanse and God does give your life back to you. And God will make it all right no matter what anybody else thinks about. It. Amen. There is hope and there is joy and there is peace after sin. Amen. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate the help this morning. I'll tell you what, I was in Arkansas at a funeral this week, and old brother Donnie, Donnie Valines got up, and he got up to preach at two old canes like this. He walked to the pulpit, didn't even have a Bible with him. He didn't need one. He just quoted and quoted and quoted and quoted. Amen? Amen. Well, it's good. I like old-time preaching. I like old-time preaching. Well, anyway, David wants you to know something. Hey, you ain't the first one fell in the mud hole. I'll tell you what's wrong with most of you kids in this church. Some of you make me mad. I love you, but you aggravate me. I'll tell you why. Because most of the parents I've ever pastored in this church came out of the hippie generation, and they've been through a lot of sin. And they love God because God brought them up out of that horrible pit and set their feet on a solid rock and gave them a new song in their heart, gave them a new life. And them, them mom and daddy had been saved out of that stinking low-down drug culture hippie life you know what they said? They said, I'm not going to raise my kids in that garbage. I don't want my kids living in that junk. And we're going to get in a Bible preaching church and we're going to teach them right. And we ain't going to have the TV running and the rock music on and the rot, rot and the neck and clothing. And they're going to try to raise their kids right. They want to give you something they didn't have. Amen. So you grow up in church and you didn't get to rock and roll and you didn't get to do this and you didn't get to do that. So you're mad. Yeah. You, you mind me of them football players at a ball game. You're spoiled rotten. Been raised in church and loved and prayed with and prayed over and taught the truth. And you sit there like a squall baby waiting until you're 18 so you can get out of here. Make me sick. You're just like them NFL players. Making a million five, making two, five, three million dollars. And won't even get, stand and pledge allegiance to the flag that made it possible that they can make that kind of money doing something they love to do. That's the stupidest out of hell satanic garbage I ever heard of in my life. You say, Reggie, it's sure lots of people rolls in and out of here, and there always will be. You mark it down in your day book. You preach on sin, people ain't going to like it. I want to tell you something. There's good news. You get rid of that sin, God will put a song in your heart. It's like somebody testified this morning. You get, turn, turn your Bible now to, to Psalm 32. Psalm 32, that's the next one. Now, we looked at Psalms 32. We're going to read it real fast and get on down the road. Psalms 32, old David starts off. Now, here he comes to the second one now, see? And he said, you know what? He said, yes, I sinned. And yes, I suffered. And yes, it was shameful. And yes, it was hard. And yes, I couldn't sleep at night. And yes, my bones waxed old. And yes, I'll never be back what I used to be. But he said, God has forgiven me. And there's never going to be a sweeter song in your soul than the Lord has forgiven you of your sin. And you're reconciled and made right with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Never going to be anything any happier than that. You can't beat that. Amen. And if, and if you think you can, you ain't never experienced it. Here's 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed the man whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. 
and his spirit, there's no guile. Oh, David said, man, it's good to get right with God. Amen. When I kept silence, watch it. My bones waxed old through all my roaring all the day. David said, I've been aging while I, while I wasn't getting right with God. Didn't look right. I'll tell you what I've seen people do. I've seen them get on drugs and drink and do everything, get into immorality, and they don't even look like the same person they used to be. They will age. When you sin and will not get right, you won't have complete repentance. You will age. You'll age. He said, for night and day, thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture's turned into the drought of summer. He said, I've dried up. Verse number five, I acknowledge my sin unto thee and mine iniquity have I not hid. And so I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Now, we went all through the rest of that last week. Turn over to Psalms 38, number 3 out of 7. Psalms 38. I'm trying to run now. Psalms 38. Everybody get there and what do you do? Say hallelujah. hallelujah. All right. We're about there. Now, the rest of you didn't get there because I say praise the Lord. Now, now I know to go. All right. Now, we're going to go. All right. Verse number, verse number 1, chapter 38. This is your third Psalm where David was... I mean, he, here, here's what's going on. Oh, we go up to, we go into church house and we run up, we get big trouble. I've seen it happen a thousand times. We get into trouble, you know, and the next thing we do, we'll make a little trip to the altar or we'll do a little bit of something, make mom and dad think we're getting right and we'll kind of get right, you know, next thing, right back out into it. David knows something. Sometimes you can get into sin so sorry, so bad. It's got such a clutch on you. It's got such claws in you. It's got its hooks in you. Yeah, I'm telling you, just a little old surface deal is not going to do it. Hey, you're going to get deep in sin. You may take you seven psalms to get out of it. I'm talking about the real deal. I'm not talking about. And you may have to go out in the backside of your farm and stay there for all afternoon. You may have to stay there till past supper. And Mama wondering where you're at. We need to get back to old time repentance. I'll tell you why a lot of folks can't enjoy church. They can't be happy because they've never, it's all been a surface, incomplete, on the surface repentance deal just to kind of slide by with God. God is God. He's putting up with, look what he said there. Verse number one, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thine hot displeasure. Watch this. Thine arrow stick fast in me. I can't get rid of it. I can't get rid of it. It's sticking down in my soul. He said, thy hand presseth me sore. God's pressing his hand on David. Verse number three, watch this. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. He said, God, oh, I mean, what the, you know, hey, did you know David, Nathan didn't come down to David and said, David, did you know God's got a wonderful plan for your life? He loves you, David. You don't read Nathan saying nothing about God loving him. David knew God loved him. He knew that from the time he was a boy. That wasn't the message he was needing to hear. He needed to hear a message. God's angry with you. And can I say to you, if you're in sin here today, or you're listening to me over this broadcast, and you're in sin, God is angry with you. And that's not, that's Bible. Amen. He said there in verse number three, there's no sound in my flesh in my flesh because of thine anger, neither there's any rest in my bones. I can't sleep. He said, because of my sin. My iniquities are gone over my head as a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me. Verse number five, my wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I'm troubled. I'm bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. I ain't got no smile on me. I ain't got no joy. I ain't got no happiness. Everything's sour. Everything's sour on me. Now watch verse 7. For my loins are filled with a loathsome disease. I want to tell you something. You know what David had? Venereal disease. Read your Bible. He's telling you his loins are filled with a loathsome disease. Hey, don't piddle with me. David was a woman chaser. He'd take your wife so fast make your head swim. Well, read your Bible. By the time Bathsheba was on, I don't even know how many wives the Bible's listed and how many children he had by the time he was messing with Bathsheba long after he had many wives and many children. But I'm going to tell you about lust. It's never satisfied. And it'll burn out on you. And what used to make you happy won't make you happy. What used to satisfy you won't satisfy you. And can I tell you somewhere the long of life, and I'll believe this, God will have to show me, said, Reggie is wrong about that. Well, why do you write in there, my loins are filled with a loathsome disease then? You mess around. Can I tell you kids something? Uh, you ought to be smarter than to go messing around. You're living in dangerous days. You wind up with AIDS. That ought to scare you out of the back seat. Amen. Besides the love of God. Besides doing what's right. I'm telling you, listen. If there's nothing new under the sun. David had messed around and got so deep. There ain't no telling what David done that God didn't record. Did you know most of us ain't never going to tell everybody everything we've been doing either? Ain't that right? And so anyway, he, he, he comes down through there in verse number eight. I'm feeble and sore broken. I'm going to tell you that's what God does with you. The longer you will refuse to repent, the more God's going to put the pressure on you. 
He said, I've roared by reason of disquietness of my heart. Lord, all my desires before thee, my groaning is not hid from thee. My heart panteth, my strength faileth. As for the light of mine eyes, it's gone from me. My lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sword. My kinsmen stand afar off. Wow. They also that seek after my life lay snares for me. He's got more troubles than that. He's got people hate his guts now. He's got all kinds of people mad at him. You read their story of Absalom. I want to tell you something. That man had a lot of people against him in that country. And he said, they seek my hurt and speak mischievously. Imagine deceits all the day long. But I as a deaf man heard not as a dumb man that opened on his mouth. Thus there was a man that heareth not and in whose mouth there were no reproofs. David said, I tell you what, God was trying to reprove me, trying to rebuke me every way you come in. But I wouldn't pay no attention to God. Verse 15, for in thee, O Lord, do I hope that I will hear, O Lord, my God. Here's the thing I want you to get. Yes, yes, yes. God wants deep, thorough, honest, clear, clean repentance. Don't hide nothing. Don't hold nothing back. Throw yourself on the mercy of God. But know this, that if you do, God will forgive you. If you have complete repentance, you're, you mean business with God, and you're not monkeying around. You're not like the old boy I visited in the hospital up there and back when they used to cut you open. And he, I walked in there in the room, and he's old Reggie. I'm so glad. I didn't even know he was in the hospital. He's old Reggie. I'm so glad to see you. And he's a crying and boo-hooing. And said, he said, look at this. Man, they had them big, I'll call them hog rings in the chest. That's how they used to do that. He said, they cut me wide open, did three open, three bypasses on me. He said, Reggie, I tell you, I ain't been living for God. I ain't been right for God. But Reggie, I tell you, when I get out of this hospital, you're going to see me at church every Sunday. And I never did see him. And I can tell you story after story after story after story. Oh, Reggie, my wife left me. I got to get right with God. Oh, Reggie, my kid's in trouble. I got to get right with God. Oh, Reggie this and Reggie that. Hey, that's incomplete repentance. I tell you, if nobody, if nobody wants to listen to you, you'll go get with God and say, dear God, I've sinned against you and I don't care who likes it, who don't like it. You're done. It's over with. You're out of here. No more game plan. No more junk. No more trying to impress anybody. No try, No more. Hey, kids. No more trying to make mom and daddy think everything's good when it's not. No more spousal stuff where you're a, you're an eye of the women and eye of the men, and you're trying to act like everything's rose in your marriage, but it's not. I'm talking about David is teaching you and I complete repentance. Get right with God. Get real. Most of us got margarine religion. It ain't the real butter. He said there in verse number. Now watch verse number. 15, for in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Thou will hear, O Lord, my God. I'm telling you not from a preacher's pulpit standpoint. I'm stepping out of this pulpit telling you on flat feet. I've been where David's at in the sense of that. Oh, I didn't do everything David's done, but I'm just as guilty a sinner. If I'd have had the chance and the power he had, I'd have probably done worse, Brother Terry. Not going to get up here and act like I'm something. I can tell you that when I've got away from God and got out of the will of God and sinned against God, I'm going to tell you right now, when I got right with God, that's exactly how it was. I knew God had forgiven me. I felt the joy of the Lord, felt the peace of God come back in my soul. But I'm going to tell you something my Heavenly Father kept telling me, Reggie, don't play games with me. I don't want to have to hit you like you're going to need it if you do, Reggie. I've been there. I've been chasing. I've, I'll tell you, I've been where I've sinned and didn't, didn't do the right with God. And I'm going to tell you something. It's exactly like David says. That's the way it is. He said, Lord, I, in thee do I hope. Thou will hear, O Lord, my God. I said, hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me when my foot slippeth. Isn't it amazing how other people are glad when you fall? I know a dear preacher, a friend of mine. I, I love him. And he got messed up. Bad. And uh, he came to my house late night. I've told you a story about it. I can't go nowhere across country. I was down in Arkansas this week, went to a funeral. You know what? I had two men down there asking me about him. And I'm hoping that they were asking for the right reasons. But you kind of get this idea that, Ralph, I wonder how many people would be glad if, if I fell. That'd make a good conversation around the coffee shop for the next 16 years, wouldn't it? I wonder how it'd be, Ralph, if you fail. Boy, I'd make a good conversation around the country for a long time. That'd be talk for three generations. Well, now, your great-grandpa was Ralph, but he got messed up with another woman who left Christy. And that's how come this here, and then they'd take you on down the road, see? Pray for your daddy and your mama. Pray for your daddy and your mama. They need your prayers. The devil wants to make you a statistic. Oh, David knew what he's talking about here. Verse number 17, he said, I'm ready to halt. 
Amen. I'm ready to hope. You ever hear the old guard say, hope? That's what the Holy Ghost does when you sin. Hope. Stop. You're going to get, and what if happens if you don't halt? Hey, you walking into some place and there's a security guard and he says, halt. I don't have to halt. What's going to happen? You're going to wish you'd have halted. Amen. And I'm telling you right now, God is hollering halt at you this morning. He said, halt. And he said, my sorrows continue before me for I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. And I want to tell you something. Now, listen, it's getting close to time letting out and you write it down. I want you to study 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9 through 11. It's going to list seven evidences of genuine repentance. I'll run through them in just a little bit. Now we're going to run one more. Go to, uh, no, we're not going to do it. We're going to stop. I'm going to give you these seven things because tonight we're going to kick. Tonight you come back, we're going to kick into the next psalm, which is Psalms 51. That's the crown jewel mountain. Have you ever been out in the, what's that big mountain range out in Wyoming? Wyoming? Grand Tetons. If you look at the Grand Teton, there's kind of these, and they're beautiful. But then it comes, comes up, and it goes, woo! Psalms 51 is the Grand Teton of the seven mountains of David's repentance. We're going to get there tonight. Now, let me tell you what it says in, Psalm, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And I know I'm an honorary preacher. I know that you're probably sitting out there. I would like your preaching, but your attitude's not good. I don't know what to do about it. I'm sorry. Pray for me. Because I want your best, and I want my best. You got to understand something when I'm preaching. I'm preaching. It's, it's like the devil standing out there and me and him's at it. <laughs> that's why. That's the whole way I preach. I'm not getting on you guys. I'm a preaching at the devil. You know what I'm saying? I'm preaching to you, but I'm fighting the spiritual warfare while I'm preaching. It's like I'm going to hand over here and one fist is hitting the devil and the next is trying to preach. That's the way it is. But I want to give you those seven things. You can turn it if you want to, but you don't have to. I'll give them to you real quick. Number one, God says if you completely repent, the first thing you'll see is a clearing. That's what it says. He said, no, I'm sorry, a carefulness, a carefulness. He said, what carefulness it wrought in you. Now, what's that mean? That means that you sinned, God dealt with you, you got right, you really repented, you're going to be careful. Amen. Oh, let's use old brother Blair for just a little bit. Blair, you don't care, you're on the back seat anyway, back here at that cheap seat back here. Let's say old Blair still had a problem with liquor. He got saved. Boy, that old Bud Light, man, light. He liked them two buds in the evening. And Bud knew the Lord dealing with him. But Blair, you, I saved you. I, get out of that trash hole. Stay, stay away from that liquor. He, he, I, boy, I'm going to stay away from that liquor. And he's coming home on a hot August afternoon. Air conditioner ain't working. And he sees a sign with ice and cold drips of water coming off a Bud can on the sign. And the old devil says, why, well, it'd be nothing wrong with going by. You don't have to buy but a can or a six pack. Blair, just go by. And Bud says, well, I guess it wouldn't be no harm in driving by the beer store. <laughs> it won't hurt to look at it. And he drives by the beer store, and he makes it past it, and he goes, Whew, boy. And then the devil says, there ain't a verse in the Bible. Jesus, and, the, and here comes the devil with scripture. Jesus turned water into wine. All them old fogies that talk about liquor stuff. Now, listen. It's one thing to be saved, but you don't want to go too far with this thing. But Blair, drive on back around, pick you up a six-pack. Blair, drive around there and give me a six-pack. Let me tell you about the problem right there is. Now, if he did that and he saved, God's going to whoop him so bad. By the time he gets off the floor with God, he sees a, a Bud Light sign on the highway. He's going to go, Pfft. you saw it old damn bunch of snakes. You want to kill my family, my marriage, and my children? If I go by the beer joint, it's going to be to burn it down. That's carefulness. Devil says, go by the beer joint. I ain't going by the beer joint. Not going to get close to it. Not looking at it. I'm going to be careful. That's genuine repentance. Okay? Then the next thing it says is clearing. I like this one, Brother Dean. Because I want to tell you, that's what we're really needing. You repent. You have a genuine repentance like David did. You know why David could talk about God and the blessings of God and the joy of the Lord and the happiness of God in his life? Because God had cleared him. When you genuinely repent, you are cleared in the court of God. You walk right out of the courthouse of God and you can skip your way down the sidewalk to the truck. Because you're forgiven, you're cleared, the charges are gone, the charges are cleared against you. Amen. Clearing. Genuine, deep, honest, biblical repentance will bring clearings. Anybody got your Bible out tell me what the next one is? Indignation. You know what indignation is? That's when you're mad at sin. That's when sin makes you mad. That's why I hate liquor. I said I hate liquor. 
You know why I hate liquor? Because it destroys people's lives. It destroys, I'm talking about indignation. I don't like drugs and I don't like Playboy and I don't like anything that tears people's lives up and sends people to hell. I don't like false religions. I don't like false teaching because it takes people to hell and I'm indignant against it. I don't like lying. And you'll be indignant. When you've really repented, oh, somebody comes and says, hey, David, you want to go down to the strip joint tonight? What are you talking about? Don't you know what that did to my life? Get out of here. Indignant. Now, you, ain't gonna, you, you know better than to play with sin. Next thing, fear. Well, I'll tell you something. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the Lord, living God, the Bible said. And so you have a fear. You fear what would happen to you. You fear what would happen to the name of God. You fear what would happen to your children. You fear what would happen to the cause of Christ. Old time repentance put a fear in you to do wrong. And the next thing says puts the desire. Desire. I want to tell you something. God put desire in you. got desire. I'm talking about you do want. Hey, you know what? I desire to come to church. And it ain't because I preach. I, I desire to come to church. I want to fellowship with God. I want to see the saints of God. I desire to read my Bible. I desire to walk with God. I desire it. I, I want it. Genuine repentance will give you a Holy Ghost desire for the things of God. I want to tell you something now, listen. Uh, then, the, then the next thing, number six, is a genuine repentance brings zeal. Now, I don't know what that's about, but that's what it says. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what it are, error, but I got it. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth, it'll put zeal in you. I like that old boy. Did you hear about the old boy who got saved? He had never been raised in church. He, he ne- all he'd ever went to is go to, go, they said he went to Cardinal Ball Games and get drunk. That's all he ever did. But he got saved. God saved him good. I mean, God saved him. And the preacher got to preaching about the blood and got to preaching about the cross. And he kept hearing these old boys holler, Hallelujah, amen. Bless God, preach it. Boy, I mean, tell you what, he, boy, he's getting like this. Pretty soon he jumped up, preacher preached something. He like and jumped and said, Hot dog! <laughs> amen, that's zeal. Might be zeal without knowledge, but he's got zeal, amen. Hot dog! I'd give a lot to hear some of you say, Hot dog! <laughs> I'll tell some of you something's going to happen to you. You're going to sit there like not on a log for 32 years and your kids are going to grow up and say, I don't want to be around dad's dead religion no more. He, never, he, he said he liked that stuff. He never grunted while he's in church. Yeah. And then the last thing says revenge. You know what that means? You're going to try to damage the devil's kingdom. You're going to try to get somebody s- saved and rob hell. You're going to say, you know what? I lived for the devil all that time. I'm going to live twice as good for God. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to pour twice as much energy. I'm going to get some revenge for what the devil did to my life. Let's stand and go home. Amen. Hot dog, amen. i tell you what. I'm going to tell you something. Look, first, you say, I don't like that. I, 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 he hollers. I don't like me hollered at. I've had people tell me, Reggie, I just can't take being hollered at. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But God said, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Amen. So anyway, I just who am. I, I, I easily recognize that I'm not every pastor for everybody. I understand that. But I never will forget the first time I ever went to an old camp meeting down in Myrtle, Mississippi. We'd been there about two days and three days maybe. And finally I heard him make an announcement. He said, Brother Ronnie Simpson is going to preach this, this afternoon. Well, I'd heard a little cassette tape of his. And, when I, and boy, I thought, I, I thought the first time in my life I'd ever heard real preaching. I remember I had my little red uh, Chevrolet, what they used to call them little red trucks? Love. love, yeah. I bought it, me and Karen got married. We was in love. And had that little love pickup truck. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it had a cassette player. How many of you remember what a cassette is? How many of you remember what an eight track is? All right. Well, anyway, I had a cassette player. And a guy gave me that cassette and I plugged it in. And it's Ronnie Simpson preaching. And I'm like, man, I ain't never heard. Is this what? I mean, tell you what. It's like the Holy Ghost said, that's preaching. So I go to Myrtle, Mississippi. And he gets up and starts preaching. This is about three days in. Well, they're about three days in, man. They're getting wound up. And he starts preaching. This is no joke. And I'm going to say about a third of the way through the message, people started popping up, jumping up. I'm talking about like this right here. Hallelujah, boy. I mean, I was... Like that, because I'd never been around that before. And all I was being entertained, I was just being entertained by all the hooting and the hollering. But I'm going to tell you about a third way through his message. He got to preach on David's mighty men. I never will forget my life. It did what they called white capped in there. And they shouted him out. 
They were shouting so loud in that auditorium, three, four, five thousand people, you could not hear him preach over a PA system. And he just had to take his mic off and walked off. People flooding the altar. I mean, people just walking up and down the aisles, throwing hankies and waving their Bible in the air. And I got ruined. And I've never gotten over it. And you know what I decided when I got out of that place? This is what it ought to be like. Amen. Amen. And I want to encourage you people. You know what? You ain't, you ain't, you, I might be the beagle dog, but it ain't about me. It's about the rabbit. <laughs> and I want to encourage you. Do say amen. Do say praise the Lord. Do, I mean, maybe my, I don't know, but I'm just saying, I don't want a dead church. Amen. amen. Like B.R. Lakin said, I don't want none of this. You hold my baby. It's my turn to shout stuff. <laughs> but you know, we need to praise the Lord. That's what David did. He praised the Lord. You know why he praised the Lord? He'd gotten over his pride about how good a guy he was. He no longer was a good guy in the country. He was a wretched old sinner whom God had saved by the mercy, by the mercy, by the sweet mercy of God. And I'm telling you, he just, he wanted everybody to know, God is so good to forgive me. To wash me. Well, it's 1210. Whew. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We're glad, Lord, that it's the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. And Lord, I believe with all of my soul and all of my heart that, Lord, if we could just get back to old time biblical repentance where we didn't just, as my daddy used to say, give it a lick and a promise. But Lord, we'd stay in the saddle. Lord, we'd stay with you till, Lord, you've done a work of grace and forgiveness, of power, of cleansing and washing in our souls. Till we come out of there clean, right, cleared, washed, and the joy of the Lord has filled our hearts and our minds and our souls with worship, with gladness, with unashamedness, with boldness. Lord, I pray for these folks today as they leave this building. Lord, I don't know where David was when he wrote these things. I don't know whether he went back out on some old shepherd field by himself. Lord, I, I don't know, but I, I just feel like God, he had to have got somewhere along with you. And I would pray, Lord, that you'd help folks in this church to learn to get along with God and get out there with you and do some business. Get serious, get real, get honest. Lord, you said in Psalms 51, behold, that is our truth, the inward parts. And Lord, I pray that you'd help me. Lord, I tell you, I've been through it, probably be through it more. God, I tell you, I know you want us to get honest and you want truth. And Lord, I believe with every ounce of fiber of my soul and my being, that Lord, we can have joy and gladness, hope, peace. There can be a lightness in our step, a light in our eye, a joy in our soul. Lord, it just seems like that's what the devil's after all the time. I pray for these folks, Lord. Lord, when they've sinned, God help them to not just give it a lick and a promise. But Lord, that they'll just get down and do business with you. Make sure that thing's cleaned up and took care of and take you at your word about it. And Lord, get off their knees rejoicing that they believe your word and know that what you do is right and true. And Lord, that you'll be faithful to your word. That you want to forgive, that you want to cleanse, that you want to wash. Oh God, I pray. Help us to live clean this week, Lord. Help us not to sin. Lord, we don't want to sin. But we're thankful, Lord, that it says in the book of 1 John chapter 2, but if any man sin, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Lord, thank you for that. Bless these people, their homes, their families. I pray, Lord, that there'd be no divorces in this church. Oh, God, keep the families together. Lord, I pray, again, that we'd live clean, live right before you in joy as a child who's right with his daddy and his mama. We'll thank you, Lord, for what you do and bring us back tonight. Give us a great service. Thank you, Lord, for the good testimony service this morning. We love you, Lord. Thank you for repentance. Thank you, Lord, for the goodness that you've exhibited to us in leading us to repentance. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you tonight. God bless you.